I can make a sound My artistry will be around Long after I'm in the ground And one person feels what I said I have heard Hello and welcome to a very special minivan musician installment. I'm Don Verb and Danielle will be chiming in whenever she feels like it. This is one in which we cover what I nerdily refer to as a vancation that my small family and I took just last summer. We sincerely hope that this video inspires at least a few of you to get some time away with one another and enjoy as many beautiful places and memories as possible. We're going to show you how we went on a six-day vacation, visited 10 major attractions, and spent less than $1,500. Does that sound like something that you'd like to do? Maybe you wouldn't do it exactly as we did, but we're going to show you how we made it happen. You may be thinking, $1,500 would barely cover just a hotel expense for such a trip, and you'd be right. You'd be left with no money to do anything. And if the aim of your trip is to experience as much as possible without stressing over entry fees and concessions wherever you go, the aim is to cut the hotel out. Yes, our aim was to sleep in the minivan and we even did a test run at a campground a month in advance. One side of the stowage needed to be used for emergency tools so we put all of the seats down into the floor and found that we had room for a twin mattress. A twin for three people sounds crazy, right? Well, it's really not. Her and I slept close together and Micah was either at the foot of the mattress or in the space on the side with layers of bedding beneath him in his own little bed. And if one of us had a particular ailment that required more space, these van seats sure do lie pretty flat. And if you're not driving, there's a good chance that you're sleeping a bit while heading to your further out destinations. You've got to think, if the point of your vacation is to experience things, then why are you spending the majority of your budget while you're sleeping? To us, the luxury was the sights and activities, at least this time around. After the hotel rates, the next most senseless expense is snacks, fast food, drinks, things like that. Now, you can't completely avoid spending money on junk, but you can limit it, and we did so by bringing a cooler along. Lots of drinks, yogurt, pre-made, barbecue chicken sandwiches, fruit, things like that. We also had a bag of dry snacks as well. This afforded us the budget to have a big fancy dinner, but we didn't choose to. We had stuff to do, though I did finally have fresh Cape Cod lobster. We'll get to that. I won't spend all day on logistics at a van itself, but we were comfortable in a grand caravan. On the next trip, to limit the mileage on our car and to allow space for a tent and another child, we're opting for a Chevy Suburban rental, but that's another trip for another time. Now you've got to have a road itinerary and a very detailed budget, but you've got to be flexible. You've got to be ready for something like a flat tire, more on that later, or a traffic jam. You've got to be both specific and flexible, so we simply budgeted extra time and money, just in case. Our first deviation from our plan ended up happening almost immediately. Now, if you take a look in the description, we proposed a trip, and it's one that's based on you not making the same mistakes as us and enjoying some of these places even a little bit more. So check that out, and we're going to move on to the actual trip here. Now, day one, we we're leaving after a show we had on Danielle's birthday at about 3 a.m. I recommend leaving at this time on a long road trip. The driving is stress-free. It starts the trip off on a good foot. The first stop on our trip was to be the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, a hefty nine and a half hour drive. We'd have gotten there around 12.30 p.m. While everyone was sleeping, I accidentally searched attractions nearby and found that stopping at Niagara Falls, New York would only add an hour of driving time onto our trip. Neither one of us had been there since we were kids and Micah had never been there, so after concurring with the briefly waking family, when I gassed up in New York, we decided to add the natural spectacle to our itinerary. We arrived in Niagara Falls at around 10 a.m. and witnessed the power that is that group of massive rapids. We spent just a couple of hours, but that's really plenty of time unless you opt to go on one of the boats or something like that. That was never our intention, so we got some great pictures and video, experienced the awe in the child's eyes, and soaked up as much beauty as we could. I stopped at a place called Sugar Street Cafe, link in description, and got a great frozen coffee and a few scones. It was time to go somewhere I'd wanted to visit since I was a child, Cooperstown. Danielle, any thoughts on Niagara Falls? I love Niagara Falls. I, I hadn't been there since I was a kid, probably like, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11. But it was, it was great to have Micah see it, and, you know, the falls are so huge and powerful that it is amazing no matter how many times you see it so that was awesome i had budgeted and planned to not just visit the hall of fame but also the heroes of baseball wax museum while there 
Being that we're hitting the pavement of upstate New York prior to Labor Day, they're open till 9 p.m. We'd be arriving there after a four-hour drive at around 6.30. Perfect. Being that our first day two attraction was outdoors and a little more relaxed as far as how much time we did or didn't spend there, we could go to the Baseball Hall of Fame the following morning before hitting the road to go to Vermont. Now, the Heroes of Baseball Wax Museum is a really cool place to visit for both baseball fans and those who don't know much about the pastime. From Jackie Robinson to George W. throwing out the first pitch after 9-11, there's lots of history here put on display in the visual form. There's also a bit of audio and video as well, and as you can see from these images, the wax figures are tremendously detailed. I've seen a lot of reviewers complaining about the lighting within the museum, but it's really a non-issue. Sure, it seems a bit dark walking through, but I was under the impression that the darker ambiance made the features of the figures stand out more. I guess there are tours available, but we did our own thing. We spent probably an hour and a half in there, and the price really wasn't bad. There's a link in the description for the Heroes of Baseball Wax Museum. I give them a very positive review. What say you, Danielle? The Wax Museum, the Baseball Wax Museum, that place was really cool. I love wax museums anyway. And Micah loved it too. That was his first one. It's almost creepy how real they look, though. Because they almost look like they're going to like walk right towards you. <laughs> like they're... But it's amazing, and it's pretty cool. I didn't know you were creeped out by wax museums. They're, well, I love wax museums, mm -hmm. but they make me a little... It's just, they look so real. Like, it's its crazy. Yeah, but, but, yeah, they, it was really cool. So it's about 8.15 p.m. in Cooperstown, and it's really a beautiful little place. It's bustling, there's some cool little corner bars, busy but not rowdy. There's a baseball card shop across the street that has a ridiculous amount of autographs, not just sports either. I bought a couple of packs of cards and spent some time in there just looking around. Now, I will warn everyone that aside from the bars, most places, at least when we were there, on a weeknight, close early. We went right across the street to Sal's Pizzeria for some Brooklyn-style pizza, though. Huge slices that were great. They got some hefty subs, a great assortment of pastas, everything that you could want. We got some pizza with giant chunks of sausage on it. She got some vegetarian pizza with sun-dried tomatoes. I think I ate half of her food as well. It was really good. We got some breadsticks too, I believe. They got a small patty going back. The atmosphere was energetic. I was a fan of that place. So there's a link in the description, and we will be back there. Hey, baby, what you think of Sal's? The pizza place, Sal's Pizza in cooperstown that place was good it was really good i was starving and that was like one of the only places that was open too and we got lucky because it was really good pizza and they had really good veggie pizza which i'm pretty picky about as a vegetarian surprisingly but it was really good so a bit worn out from the road we were ready to crash somewhere and attack day two problem was that we had planned to stay at a truck stop further along our route but we had changed our schedule. So what's open in America while everything else is closed? Walmart. We found a Walmart about a half hour or so away and decided that we'd crash there for the night. We had these suction cup window blinds that you can buy at Walmart for about $8 a piece. We had the giant windshield blocker that was put in place and we had a bit of privacy. Now ain't nobody looking inside your van unless they're a thief. Usually a thief ain't gonna go to security or to the police, so there's that. But yeah, it was quite a winding road uh, uh, going to that Walmart. I'm pretty sure I scared Danielle on the country roads a couple of times, but it was also very secluded and quite beautiful. After a brief stop at a gas station to reorganize the cooler, top off the gas, and start getting the rear of the van in order so we could turn it into our camper for the night, we got to the Walmart at around 10.45 p.m. As long as you park somewhere where you can stash the cooler outside the vehicle and you put the spare tire underneath the van, you've got an acceptable amount of space. We rotated the stuff from the back into the front and we we're good to go. You could buy some small fans to plug into your car lighter, but we didn't even end up using ours. It was still pretty hot, but after running the AC while driving for nearly an hour, the van stayed pretty cool until the sun came up. We were all remarkably exhausted, so sleeping was no chore and we fell asleep pretty quick. So day one, we visited Niagara Falls, the Heroes of Baseball Wax Museum, and we ended up sleeping at the Walmart in Gloversville, New York. We drove 683 miles, spent $55 in gas, and about $71 in admission fee and random stuff. We slept a solid seven hours, used the bathrooms at Walmart and changed our clothes there, got out the jug of water to brush our teeth, had a few snacks and drinks, and hit the road again. I think we just snacked on stuff that we had in the cooler, and we were back in Cooperstown by 9 a.m. when the Hall of Fame opened. 
Now this half of the day isn't 100% honest. We had to shave some time spent at attractions because a true glitch in the matrix happened and we'll have a separate video on that. Seriously, back to it though. The Baseball Hall of Fame is larger than I even thought that it would be. You're going to want to allow yourself at least three hours here, especially if you're a fan of the sport. It's a lot to take in. Even as someone who truly appreciates the historical significance of the game of baseball in America, I was taken aback by all of the exhibits. The cultural impact, the stories, the collectibles, the civil rights aspects, the folklore, it's all quite magical to a sports fan. One thing I'll tell you to be careful of though, when you get up to the admission counter, know that the actual hall of plaques is to the right. The main museum is up the stairs to the left, I didn't get to see the bronze breast statues or the uh, plaques. I'm still a little bothered by that, but we'll keep it moving. Here's some more photos of the wide array of types of stuff that they've got in there. Also, I'll add the gift shop is really cool and that the pricing isn't crazy. Uh, I've got the uh, link in the description, and I say that the Hall of Fame is a great place to visit. The kids seem to enjoy it plenty, despite Dad geeking out and wanting to spend days in the place. Not quite a, being a baseball head, what do you think about it, baby? The Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame, was amazing. Um, basically, we were going there more for you than anybody because you're the baseball person in the family. I like baseball, but, like, I'm not into it like you are. But, you know, I went into it thinking, oh, yeah, it'll be just, you know, whatever. It was really freaking cool. Great place to experience for all of us. And we have to go back because they have so much stuff you don't have time to like see everything unless you spend several hours there the amount of memorabilia they have there is incredible and i learned a lot of things that i didn't know which was really cool so so that was sweet the only regret that i have about cooperstown is that i would have liked to have spent more time there in fact i think that we'll spend a weekend there one summer because the town's north end is completely bordered by ostego lake They've got a tour boat company there, a resort hotel, a beautiful lakefront area that we caught a glimpse of the first night, Doubleday Field, the Cooperstown Bat Company, a couple of bed and breakfasts, the Susquehanna River, if I'm saying that right, and a distillery, if you're not ridiculously sober like me, and a lot more going on. After about three hours in the Hall of Fame, we are back on the road before 1 p.m., and our next stop was Thundering Brook Falls Trail in Killington, Vermont. It's a part of the Green Mountain National Forest and considered one of the most beautiful waterfalls and trails that you'll find in the United States. Count us in. We arrived in Killington, Vermont at about 4.30 p.m. on day two. We slowed down a few times and detoured off in the main road to take in the beauty that was all around us. We don't have pictures, but we made a few cow friends and checked out the mountains and some of the better known ski launches in the region. The marshy area that's the beginning of the Thundering Brook Falls Trail is great for beginners and kids and similar to one of the better places near our home, except this one is surrounded by mountains and probably tens of thousands of acres of evergreens. It adds to the allure of the place that the entrance is quite understated and has a small area for parking. It can make for a surprise when you realize how large, powerful, and gorgeous the falls are. Danielle opted to utilize her monkey toes and cross over the falls themselves. Even found a pineapple that joined our trip. Rest in peace to that pineapple. He was a cool and random find. The trail gets a little difficult if you are attempting to make it to the absolute top of the falls. It wasn't particularly difficult for me or her, but it was hard when essentially carrying a five-year-old as I went. Truth be told, I think that we decided not to take the common trail and went with the more difficult option that went right along the falls. We both agreed that this was a place that we could spend all of our days. As you can tell from the pictures that we have here, it's difficult to imagine a place that is more pleasing to the eye. We spent a couple of hours just climbing, exploring, and enjoying the peace that is the nature of Thundering Brook Falls. To be accurate, we didn't do all of the trails, just the main one that led to the top of the waterfall that's part of the Kent Brook. To my understanding, I guess that there are other falls here, there is Kent Pond, there's a lot more. There's even a lodge that's right in the middle of it all. This is another place that I'd like to visit more in depth at a later date. Danielle, what did you think of the Thundering Brook Falls Trail? That was probably my favorite part of the whole trip. The trails were great, the falls themselves were breathtaking. Uh, I love that kind of stuff though. I'm most at peace and most content in those type of settings really. So. I took my shoes off, hiked up the whole thing barefoot, through all the sticks, stones, dirt, all that shit. Walked in the actual falls in the water and stuff up there. It was great. Someone had thrown a pineapple into the falls too. Like, I mean like a whole big ass pineapple. <laughs> it was random as hell, but I picked it up and took it with us and it ended up coming with us for a lot of the trip. So. But I would go back there a million times if I could live there right next to that place, I would. 
While entering Vermont, I had become obsessed with finding real Vermont cheddar cheese, the white cheddar that's raved about by foodies everywhere. We'd stopped off at the Vermont-New York border and had some Egg McMuffins, but maybe my constant talk of regional cheese had gotten everyone hungry. After a couple of unsuccessful tries at other places, I found some mainstream but authentic Vermont white cheddar cheese at the Killington Market. Definitely going to link to them because if you're in the area, they also have great macaroni salads and things like that. After a bit of fitting nourishment, we are moving again, heading toward Boston. Along the way, we had planned to check out the Toy Museum in Keechee Gorge. It's only a 45 minute drive, it's right on the way and it looked to be pretty damn cool. Unfortunately, the Toy Museum wasn't open. I couldn't tell if it was closed down indefinitely or if we had just arrived late, but either way, no Toy Museum. However, the area was a complete tourist trap and we decided that, hey, we're tourists. We're saving money by doing this the way that we do it, so let's blow some cash on dumb shit. There's a toy store that has a lot of old school stuff and is interesting. We bought a couple of things in there. I think that we got a throwback Winnie the Pooh stuffed animal or something. I got a Vermont snow globe because I collected those as a kid. There are also alpacas to feed and they definitely had varying personalities. Pretty cool little break. Micah loved it and we love animals and so hell why not. We went into the antique mall as well and I got Danielle a ton of great incenses. Back in the road after Keechi Gorge, it was just about two hours to Boston. By then, it would be time to crash out for the night and check out the home of the Red Sox in the morning. And by afternoon, we'd be at Nauset Beach in Cape Cod. Being that we're campers these days, and that's how we may conduct our next trip, we'd maybe suggest camping at Wadley State Park or Mount Kearsarge State Park, which are both along the route that we took, I-89 in New Hampshire. Nevertheless, we stopped off in Haverhill, Massachusetts, about 45 minutes north of Boston. This would be our first night sleeping at a truck stop. It was about 9 p.m. We were quite exhausted after all of the climbing, driving, and simply taking things in. So, recap of day two. We went to the Baseball Hall of Fame, Thundering Brook Falls Trail, and Keechee Gorge. Our uh, fuel expense was $28, 351 miles. And between attractions, food, etc., we only spent $95. Okay, so the top of day three is a perfect example of when you learn from our mistakes. I'm sure that Boston is an amazing city to explore, on foot, by bus, or on bicycle, skateboard, I don't care. But our venturing into a town that we wanted to spend some real time in during morning rush hour by car was a bad plan altogether. For our final 17 miles into Boston, we drove an hour and two minutes. It felt more like four hours. In addition to that, and as my boss can attest, Google Maps or not, the roads aren't going to make sense to you in many instances. They just come to an end. You're going to have a split second to choose the right lane or whatever to get into. If you choose the wrong one, you'll be put 20 minutes out of your way. It's a nightmare. And being on a very busy trip like we were, all you do while sitting in traffic is think about all the places you'll have to rush through seeing, the places you may not reach, how an hour now is an hour taken off your last day. It's all bad. We really should have just stayed the night in Boston or just given ourselves more time, but either way, I digress. Left a return for me to be able to nerd out at all of the historical stuff in Boston, but I did get to exercise some of my nerddom at Fenway Park. I just wanted to walk around it, get some close-up pics, take in the pennant, see the cask and flag in, and just get a feel for it all. I not only knew of a statue or two, but there was a lot more than I thought. There was a game that day, but it wasn't in our plans to attend it. However, there is a Boston Red Sox game worked into our proposed trip in the description. After spending around an hour at Fenway, we decided that we are going to head to Southie. South Boston had been talked about in many movies and TV shows since our childhoods. Goodwill Hunting, The Town, The Departed, stuff like that. We were led to believe that it was kind of a white ghetto that had stood in the sparkling intellectual city shadows for over a hundred years. I had a certain picture in my mind that the area didn't quite live up to. However, it's really cool in different ways. I'm going to assume that Southie has been gentrified. We basically couldn't find a rundown building or home. It didn't seem to be a rough and tumble type of place or impoverished area at all. Now the churches are still standing, centuries old and majestic. We got photos of a few really gorgeous places of religious architecture. We walked much of the area and I just loved the brownstones. I believe that's what they're called. And we found that we had a love for photographing doorways and stoops. The scenery of the area was really quite nice and we considered making the walk all the way to Pleasure Beach, which is right there on the east side of South Boston, but being that our next stop was a major beach, we stopped off at Medal of Honor Park and let Micah play. There's tons of kids there, friendly parents, and it's a really great park right there in the middle of the neighborhood. There's tons of stuff for kids to play on, and if you're an adult in a conspiracy theory, it's interesting to see what the Medal of Honor Park looks like from its aerial view. 
After plenty of exercise and getting some energy out of the little guy, we are on our way to the famed Nauset Beach and Lighthouse in Cape Cod. The drive is about two hours, but we drove around three. There were great sights along the shore, and we made a few stops for refreshments and gas. Late in the season as we were, the beach wasn't overly crowded, and we got to spend some time checking out the lighthouse and stuff like that. Unfortunately, we didn't see any seals or sharks there. There are great white shark warnings all over in different parts of the beach, which is cool in a strange way. Absolutely gorgeous beach and a true ocean experience with crashing waves, surfers, windsurfers, wakeboarders, all of that fun stuff. But then again, it's still kind of small enough to feel somewhat private. The tide was a little too strong to swim with a small child, but we had plenty of fun in a few feet of water, enjoying the smooth sand, collecting the seashells, and listening to the sea. This is definitely a place worth revisiting. I had to have a lobster roll while in Cape Cod. I found a small place right near Nauset Beach called Lobster Shanty, and the link is in the description, of course, and it was great. Very fresh, flavorful, pretty big as well. I saw some reviews calling it a tourist trap due to the high prices, and yes, the price was quite high, but it's less than two miles from the beach and it's damn good. I recommend it. It was voted best lobster roll for a reason after all. Maybe just go with the roll. Either way, it was a great Cape Cod experience in Cape Cod. That's what I look for. We had just a two hour drive to the very famous, rightfully so, Cliff Walk in Newport, Rhode Island. We weren't getting there until about 8.30 p.m. or so, so we were going to check it out as part of our planning for the next day, and motivation as well. There was a TA truck stop there that we'd be calling home for a couple of days. It was close to where we were headed, wasn't crazy busy, had nice big hot showers, and would work out perfectly for us. We headed that way and it started to rain hard. The weather had been near perfect for most of our trip, but it was really hitting us. I had replaced our front two tires and gotten the brakes done prior to us leaving. Well, at least the new tire didn't blow. It was a one in the back. Yep, tire blew. Luckily, we were within less than a mile from a Shell gas station, and I'd have a decent place to change the tire. It really sucked doing it in the rain, which was cold as hell in contrast to the heat, but I had a hot shower to look forward to and wasn't going to let this ruin our trip. Of course, we'd have to replace the donut with a real tire, but we found a place that listed all of their inventory online that was only about 12 miles away from where we were going to sleep. Good thing that we kept that spare that had been such a pain when turning in every night. We still continued to Newport and got a nice peek at the cliff walk at night. The waves were powerful in the darkness, quite scary to be honest. We caught glimpses of the mansions. We found out that the Selv Regina University has a lively group of students that are all about partying. After that situation, we got to the TA after midnight and I'm quite sure we passed out immediately. Now a recap of day three, we made it to Boston, Nauset Beach and Lighthouse, had a sneak peek at the uh, cliff walk, and we ended up sleeping at a truck stop for the first night and I had my lobster roll. So we drove 263 miles, which is about $21, attractions, food, etc., 50 bucks, and we ended up spending $20 on showers. Day four, Tuesday, August 27th. I think that we slept at least nine hours. West Greenwich is a very quiet place with murders of crows, hawks, and other stuff I was in awe of. Just like before, there had been other people crashed out there, two who apparently snuck away to do their adult thing, and their car wouldn't start the next day. Humanity. The showers are huge. Maybe I am just not used to the trucker light, but I was impressed. Clean and private, 10 bucks, who needs a hotel? I felt great. Anyway, we had to go get our tire replaced, and that took under two hours, and it was actually on our way to the cliff walk in Easton's Beach. I put a uh, link to Melbourne's in the description. They are great for us, and they got several locations in that area. We are at Easton's Beach, which is at one end of the cliff walk by 12.45 p.m., and it's really a beautiful place. You're going to get that real Cape Cod feel there, too. You're going to get the sailboats. It's a nice little bay, great uh, whitish sand. Beautiful place. Now, we had our only little disagreement of the trip during this time, but we eventually broke out of that and headed to Mystic Aquarium. This place was awesome. I'm pretty sure that it was under $60 for the three of us, and it had rays that you could pet as they swam by, beluga whales, which is Danielle's favorite, I, I think they call it the ghost whale, a sea lion show, seals, penguins, lots of jellyfish, sharks, they had an aviary where the little tropical birds would eat off of a stick that you held. I think we were there until they closed and thoroughly enjoyed the place. Very, very high recommendation from the minivan musician. Quite kid friendly, but plenty interesting for adults. It's only about 40 minutes from the cliff walk. There's also Old Mystic Village, which has some cool places in it. It's essentially an outlet mall type of place, but it's mostly food and little specialty places. I grabbed a pair of Red Sox warm-up pants there on sale from their sports store, which had a great array of local gear and more. And it was time for dinner. 
We had an Applebee's gift card. We went to the one at Stonington. Mike had played some games on the table that they charged us for. Their food kind of sucked, but it's Applebee's. Whatever. After that, it was back to our home base, the TA in West Greenwich. So, recap of day four. Made it to Easton's Beach, Mystic Aquarium, and we went out to eat at Crapplebee's. Our total fuel expense was only $10. Only drove 115 miles that day. Um, attractions, food, etc., 115 bucks. Uh, the tire cost us 120 Day 5, Wednesday, August 28th. We shower, eat, and roll out. We're at the Rose Cliff part of the cliff walk. It's dreary outside, but to me, that added something to the New England feel. The cliff walk is indescribable. You got the power in nature and crashing waves, and just on the other side of you, the most expansive mansions you'll ever see. There's different levels of difficulty when it comes to the cliff walk. You know, I don't remember which direction is which, but you can go one way and it's it's reasonably easy. Then it starts getting tougher where you're actually walking through the giant rocks and stuff like that. Being that we had Micah with us, we didn't do the entire thing. But I guess what I'm saying is that there is plenty to walk and plenty to enjoy if you got to do the uh, easier half of the walk. We didn't do a guided tour or pay to see the inside of the Marble House Mansion or anything. But we walked those cliffs for a few hours, but then we got rained on torrential downpour and the realization that Micah's constant peeing and now complaints of pain were from an infection. Once we made it out of that rain, which all of the trees in Billionaire's Row did help with, we had to go get him some medicine at the very least. We found that easily and we were on the road toward Pittsburgh. Now that drive sucked. I'd been in a car through Pennsylvania when I was a kid and thought that it took forever then only because I was a bored child. Nope, still sucks. Ten hours I endured. Through hills that I wasn't sure that the minivan was going to endure. Speed limits of 55. It was supposed to be a 10 hour drive I think. But I drove Detroit style. Got through that area in 9. It's still murder. Many many hours of nothing. There are some beautiful areas. But it just wasn't enough to, to keep my attention. Perhaps it was just the sheer distance or time involved. But never again. The map says I went through the Bronx or something. I don't remember that. I don't remember Connecticut either. Just hills, Pennsylvania, and boredom. Anyway, we're at the I-79 southbound Bridgeville rest area at 2.57 a.m. We could have been on Mars as long as I could go to sleep. I didn't care if the world was ending. Oddly enough, I only needed about five hours of sleep, and I was good. So day five recap, cliff walk, and driving. <laughs> we'll definitely be spending more time at the cliff walk and at Easton's Beach. But as far as the driving goes, 564 miles, which is about $48, and attractions, food, medicine, etc., we only spent 30 bucks. Day 6 was Thursday, August 29th. With medicine and Micah's system and some sleep under our belts, we were headed to the National Aviary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was 9.30 in the morning, and we'd be arriving by 10 a.m. First off, what did you think of Pittsburgh as a city when we first arrived, Danielle? Uh, when we entered Pittsburgh, I was pretty exhausted. Um, I think we all kind of were by that point of the trip. But I never really realized what a cool city Pittsburgh actually is. I mean, driving over, like, the huge bridges and stuff, it's really a beautiful city in its own right. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, we went to the aviary there, which was awesome. Uh, you definitely love that place. Yeah. Bird guy. But it was it was awesome. We saw a sloth it, there. I love sloths, and he got to have a bunch of really cool birds land on him and stuff. And it was it was really cool. The bridges, the architecture, the layout of the city was a very nice place in comparison to many other major cities. And the area that aviary is in and the surrounding parks, something to behold. The aviary itself was quite fantastic, separated into different climates, you're walking through essentially the birds' natural habitats and getting phenomenally close to them. They've got a separate area that's outdoors that has enormous birds of prey. There was a trained crow that would take your money if you donated a buck or two to the conservation of birds. It was a really good show. After seeing everything from toucans to parrots to penguins to birds native to the U.S. to condors, it, it was all pretty cool and stimulating. We spent about two hours at the aviary. Anyone who knows more about birds and exactly what they're looking at will likely spend about three. The next stop was Frick Park, a ridiculously expansive and very beautiful piece of nature in the middle of a major city. We initially were going to visit a small corner of it referred to as Blue Slide Park, a place made famous by the deceased MC Mac Miller. We ended up trekking through much of the park with help from a park guy. Shout out to that guy. He was helpful. We didn't realize what we were getting into and made it to the slide. 
checked out a snake that I'm going to show here just because it makes uh, Danielle disturbed. I even rode the slide myself, and I'm still in awe with how fast that thing is despite it not being very high. Danielle, I know you have stuff to add regarding the park. Frick Park, um, which is Blue Slide Park, is a part of Frick Park. Most people who know me, or even those who don't really know me, know I'm a huge Mac Miller fan, so I only knew that Frick Park existed because of Mac Miller, the kids' mixtape, and, of course, the Blue Slide Park album. I wasn't even sure if we'd be anywhere near it, so when I found out it was, like, right along the route, it was only 10 minutes from the aviary, I was pretty sweet and frick park as a whole is huge it's like 600 acres or something so it's incredible i'm full of trails and woods and it's just it's so cool we didn't even make a dent in exploring there yet but we did see a really cool snake that i uh it scared the hell out of me uh i had no idea frick park was that big and blue side park is just one small part of it I, luckily, I ran into the park guide who showed us this shortcut to get there. I'd never found it. Um, he said that he'd met people from New York and even all the way from Spain who came to see Blue Slide Park because of Mac Miller. And getting to that part of the park was bittersweet for me. Having watched the Best Day Ever video a billion times, it was really cool to see the place in person and the slide itself is built into the side of this hill and it's metal and you have to use like a piece of cardboard to ride down it and it's incredibly fast and it was so much fun Micah loved it we all got to ride down it it was really freaking sweet and there's a bunch of like rest in peace mat carvings on the table up there which is kind of sad but cool um I've been a big fan for over 10 years so it was just a really special experience for me and people come there by like the hundreds and stuff on his birthday and everything we'll for sure be going back i'm thankful i got to go there and i definitely recommend it to anybody uh, especially if you're a mac miller fan yeah so i lost my wallet there had to make a long walk around that enormous park and retrieve it that was stressful i almost think that i'd advocate wearing a damn fanny pack function over fashion at that point it's late in the afternoon we're on our way to cleveland ohio to the famed christmas story house and to visit the corner of east 99th street in st Clair, where the group bone thugs and harmony are from well between losing my wallet traffic and a few other issues we got to cleveland just as the christmas story house was closing what's really cool and that we got some pics of is that it's more like christmas story corner be careful visiting they close early in the day but we'll definitely be back Taking pics from the outside was going to have to do, and we checked out the corner, and I, of course, had to snap a pic there at uh, East 99 of St. Clair. We considered the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but it was really expensive. We were tired, and it was kind of an extra possibility on our itinerary. It hadn't been a must from the get-go. We let Micah make the call, and he was all about going to get something to eat at a restaurant and heading home. Danielle loves Tony Paco's in Toledo, and so do I. I've been going there for many years, and I'd introduced her to it when we first got together. Being that she doesn't eat meat, they've got some other great stuff there, specifically fried pickles. They've got great barbecue sauce and several other things as well. I got my usual chicken paprikash, but also added on one of their famous conies, and Mike added their chicken strips, which are better than the strips anywhere else. For those who don't know Tony Paco's, it was made famous by Klinger on the TV show MASH, and since then, they've acquired and encapsulated probably over a thousand signed buns that are on the walls of every celebrity and political figure that you could imagine. They've even got a gift shop that sells their famous relishes, chili, pickled peppers, pickles, and more stuff. Yeah, and they've got places all around Toledo where you can pick up their products. Uh, but I've only ever been to the original location. I'm going to link to that in the description because we love Tony Paco's. That drive through Ohio was rough. I love the small towns of middle American feel. Maybe that's part of why we live closer to there these days. But I think that I was just finally worn out from driving. Home was only 45 miles away, and we'd be making it back around 10.45 p.m. Maybe it's more like 10.30 because I was flying during that home stretch. Now on that last day to sixth day, we spent $26 on gas, about 326 miles. We spent 137 bucks on attractions, food, etc. So the full trip, 2,200 miles, 176 bucks in gas, $498 on attractions and food, uh, $170 on showers, medicine, tire, 
um, the pre-trip stuff ran us more than 27 bucks like 60 bucks on snacks and all of that uh, the shades for the car the fan the windshield guard got an oil change front new tires a uh, brake job so put aside $30 a week only for a year and you could take a decent vacation get yourself six or seven days you might want a day to recover from it all 30 bucks a week will get you there now nothing will work better and more truthfully in closing this video out than crafting around what we're doing in our future vacations we will be revisiting Cooperstown to spend more time there enjoying that destination for all that it can be we very much love Vermont and will probably visit again even though most go there to ski there's plenty of great sightseeing and things to enjoy in the warmer months we will be back to Cape Cod to enjoy the things that we already did, but also to possibly spend the money and time to get up close to the seals, whales, etc., maybe do some sailing. We will surely return to Mystic Aquarium. Same goes for Frick Park and Pittsburgh in general. Boston will visit when we can spend a weekend or so, perhaps. I'd like to. It'll just be separate from our next vacation. As far as whether or not we'd recommend a vacation to others, absolutely. As I said in the beginning of this video, we'll be renting a Suburban or something along those lines so that we can limit our own vehicle's wear and tear and so we can have a bit more room. But that upgrade isn't even a must. Maybe you opt for a little less overall trip mileage and or have a slightly lighter schedule, but just think of how much you save. We'll likely be doing a bed and breakfast for one night and camping a couple of nights on the next one, so there's nothing wrong with mixing in a little extra comfort, but the achievement here is saving the lodging money and having more to work with when it's actually time to do things. Let us know your experiences or your future trip ideas. We've only done this once, along with a lot of day trips and things, but any help we can be to anyone, just let us know. If you got suggestions for us on our future adventures, we'd love to hear them. We put together a list of things that we needed in order to make this trip happen. Most of it's basic stuff, but maybe there are a few things that will be helpful to you. We've also linked to the places we visited and the resources that we utilize. We're wishing a good trip to all.